In May 2016, a crude oil tanker arrived in Port Dantifer to discharge 1.9 million barrels of Bonnie crude oil. After being given the go-ahead to start the discharge, the cargo officer flooded all three cargo pumps by opening number one center cargo tank main suction valve fully, as required by the discharge plan. Number one center cargo tank was 98% full and a full bore of crude oil suddenly impacted the walls of the pump casing. Having traveled 250 meters along a 750 millimeter diameter pipeline, this violently jolted the pump assembly and the fittings connected to it. The officer in charge heard a slight shudder, but as this happened every time he flooded the pumps, he thought nothing more about it. But he didn't know that the pump suction pressure transmitters were always failing on number one and number two cargo pumps because they were being flooded in this way. More worryingly on this occasion, the impact had dislodged and weakened a suction pressure gauge pipe on the pump. As the officer in charge knew nothing about this, the rest of the cargo tanks were open to the pumps and discharge continued with the pumps at full speed. When the tanks were close to empty, the pumps suddenly became very noisy and the pump discharge pressure gauge readings fell. This indicated that it was time to stop number two pump as per the plan and slow down the other pumps as the tanks were nearly empty. Unfortunately, cavitation subjected the already weakened pressure gauge pipe to sudden vibration. This was enough to make it shear and spray crude under high pressure all over the port side of the pump room. Throughout this module, we'll learn how these types of accidents can happen. More importantly, we'll learn how they can be avoided. During bulk discharge operations, centrifugal cargo pumps are an essential component of a cargo system. However, without knowing how they generate flow and pressure, it's difficult for those controlling discharge to appreciate how to use cargo pumps effectively. Some tankers are able to discharge at rates of up to 18,000 meters cubed per hour. This is the equivalent of filling six standard 20-foot shipping containers in one minute. That's one every 10 seconds. When considering such high flow rates, it's important that those in charge of a discharging operation understand how to control the centrifugal We'll start by looking at the relationship between discharge pressure and flow for different pump rotational speeds and then we'll consider how a cargo reception facility arrangement affects pumping rates. We'll also focus on how to operate centrifugal cargo pumps effectively and how to operate pumps as cargo tanks approach stripping levels. Throughout, we'll use this pump control console to show what you need to monitor and control during the discharge operation. We'll also consider some of the practical aspects of controlling flow rates so that you can play your part in a safer, more efficient discharge operation. Centrifugal pumps are used on crude oil tankers for the transfer of ballast and cargo, as they can develop large flow rates. Let's take a look at how centrifugal cargo pumps work. As crude enters the pump, the rotating impeller speeds up the liquid. The crude then slows down as it passes through the narrow part of a spiral funnel-shaped chamber, called a volute. As the area of the volute increases, so does the pressure of the crude, which results in the crude leaving the pump with increased pressure. If you are to control the flow of crude oil cargo correctly during bulk discharge, it's important that you understand the relationship between the flow and pressure generated by a centrifugal pump. When considering the pressure generated by a centrifugal pump, it's useful to think about how far up a column a pump can lift a liquid. Pumping system designers and manufacturers refer to this as head, or more accurately, discharge head. This is usually measured in meters, but can be converted to the more familiar unit of pressure known as bar. We do this by multiplying the head by the density of the liquid being pumped and dividing it by 10197. For example, 
A head of 155 meters and a density of 890 kilometers per meter cubed would be equivalent to a pressure of 13.5 bars. How the head changes with flow is a characteristic of a centrifugal pump and this relationship can be shown on a graph. Here, the x-axis represents the volumetric flow rate in meters cubed per hour. We give this the letter Q. The y-axis represents the head in meters. We give this the letter H. The maximum head that a pump can generate occurs when the flow is zero. We call this the shutoff head and it is equivalent to what would be seen on the pump discharge pressure gauge if the valve was closed against the flow. The maximum flow occurs when head is at a minimum. This would be the case if the pump flow was totally unrestricted. Between these two points, there are a range of head conditions with corresponding flow rates. Pump manufacturers create the range of head conditions by throttling the pump discharge valve under test conditions and recording the various flow rates. The result plotted on the graph is known as a pump performance curve, or sometimes an HQ curve. You will see this in the pump manufacturer's handbook, and they will often be posted in the cargo control room. While it is theoretically possible to operate the cargo pump under the full range of head conditions, you should avoid operating the centrifugal pump close to the shutoff point because the flow rate is very restricted and the pump casing could overheat. You should also avoid operating under very low head conditions as the huge flow rates generated can cause a large torque on the pump shaft. There will be a point where the pump is developing flow and head at maximum efficiency. This is called the duty point and this is the point at which the design discharge head and flow rate meet on the pump performance curve. 4,500 meters cubed per hour flow rate and 100 meters head. Using our formula from earlier, we can work out the flow rate by multiplying the design flow rate by the given pump rotational speed divided by the design rotational speed. This gives us a flow rate of 4,500 meters cubed per hour. Similarly, we can work out the head by multiplying the design head by the pump rotational speed divided by the design rotational speed all squared. This gives us a head of 100.4 meters. In fact, we can calculate the head and corresponding flow rates for all points on a performance curve and plot. We can do this for a range of pump speeds. The resulting performance curves will be mathematically similar to the design performance curve, or HQ curve for design speed that we saw earlier in the module. In this case, our pump starts and gradually increases to its minimum speed of 650 RPM. As it does, the Shaw resistance curve crosses the pump performance curves at 2,000 meters cubed per hour and ahead of 68 meters or 6.7 bar. As we increase the pump speed to 850 RPM, we achieve a flow rate of 2,975 meters cubed per hour and a head of 116 meters or 11.4 bar discharge pressure. As we reach 1,050 RPM, we achieve a flow rate of 3,325 meters cubed per hour and a head of 144 meters or 14.1 bar discharge pressure. The final thing to consider is what happens when we operate cargo pumps under low shore resistance conditions. This can result in flow rates well in excess of the maximum permissible. Low shore resistance conditions exist when pumping to cavern storage or to storage tanks connected by a large diameter pipeline close to the tanker. This can lead to a very high torque on the pump shaft. In these types of situations, it 
is good practice to use the pump discharge valve to restrict the flow and create an artificially high head that is somewhere close to the design conditions or duty point on the HQ curve. When a cargo pump is being run up, the person in charge must recognize when there are problems and what to do about them. If after starting, the cargo pump is noisy and the suction pressure suddenly falls to zero or is negative, and the ullage in cargo tanks being discharged is not changing, it is most likely that the inline valve is closed on the pipeline on the suction side of the pump. Similarly, if the pump suction pressure doesn't fall when a pump is started and the discharge pressure rises quickly and there is no change in ullage for the tanks being discharged, an inline valve is closed on the discharge side of the pump. This could be on the ship or terminal side. If a pumping problem cannot be dealt with straight away, then the pump should be stopped immediately. As the bulk pumping continues, the pump suction pressure will decrease due to the falling tank levels, as seen by the increasing ullage. In fact, the pump suction pressure will decrease until it is negative. When the tank level is near to stripping level and the pump suction pressure gets too low, pump cavitation can occur. This is caused by the formation and subsequent collapse of vapor bubbles in a pump, which can damage the pump impeller and other pump components. This must be avoided by gradually reducing the pump's rotational speed as the cargo approaches stripping level, and eventually stopping one or two of the cargo pumps, if three are running. If you see slight movements of the pump tachometer gauge needle, or the suction or discharge pressure gauge needles, these may be the first indication of the start of pump cavitation. The pump speed should then be reduced as much as necessary until steady pumping conditions are resumed. The pump suction pressure gauges must be monitored extremely closely at this stage and the pump revolutions must be reduced until the cargo tanks reach stripping levels. At this time, the main cargo pumps should be stopped or operated with a vacuum stripping system. Earlier, we considered how a single centrifugal pump develops flow and head under high and low shore resistance conditions. But what happens when we operate two or three pumps at the same time? When two or more identical cargo pumps discharge into a common pipeline to a shore reception facility, we say they are operating in parallel. When this is the case, each of the pump's rotational speeds and discharge pressures should be the same, or very similar, to ensure they all do a similar amount of work. When the discharge pressures are different, the multiple cargo pumps are not operating together effectively, and the casing of the pump with the lowest discharge pressure will overheat because it is not pumping effectively and is contributing little, if anything, to the flow rate. Let's look at how multiple pumps operate in parallel by considering performance curves and shore resistance curves. When operating identical centrifugal pumps in parallel, they will achieve the same shutoff head as they would for one pump for a particular rotational speed. When we look at multiple pump performance curves, we see that the flow rate for two pumps operating in parallel, without considering shore resistance, will be twice that for one and the flow rate for three pumps will be three times that for one. However, if we overlay with a typical shore resistance curve in the same way as we did earlier, we see that the actual flow rate for two pumps will not be twice that for one pump, or three times for three pumps. When there are high shore resistance conditions, operating two pumps only increases the overall flow rate slightly more than if one cargo pump is running, but the discharge pressure increases significantly. When operating three pumps, the increase in flow is hardly noticeable, but again, the discharge pressure increases significantly. Under these high shore resistance conditions, Paralleling three cargo pumps 
requires careful control to match the pump discharge pressures. When operating in parallel, the rotational speed of each pump should be increased in steps of 50 or 100 RPM. Between each step, the discharge pressures should be seen to settle before increasing any further. When possible, it is always more efficient to operate two pumps at or near full rotational speed rather than using three pumps at a reduced RPM.